just come my way wherever I go Hard luck is there to stay Good luck never stays a day A bad luck's always coming my way For today's grim adventure, we find ourselves in Seattle, Washington, visiting a place that has haunted many people, including myself, for quite some time, well, since 1994. Now, to tell this story properly, we technically have to go back to March 30th, 1994, whenever Kurt Cobain, the lead singer and guitarist for the band Nirvana, checked himself into a detox in Los Angeles. And then the very next night, basically he escaped. He climbed a wall in the middle of the night, got on an airplane and flew all the way up here to Seattle to his home, which is that building, that house right on the other side of those trees. You can barely see it today. April 5th, he took his own life in the greenhouse that used to stand above the garage behind the house. They tore that down. On April 8th, an electrician who came to the house to install some security lights is the one who found Cobain's body. Now we're starting this video off in this park because this is kind of like a, a makeshift memorial to Kurt Cobain. You can barely see the house anymore because of all the trees and there's a fence, well, a gate right there at the driveway. So all fans can come over here and there's two benches you can see people have left all kinds of different things for, in memory of Kurt. Jessica was just pointing out that the flowers above the bench are actually real. So it looks like that there are two benches here in this park that fans have wrote messages to Kurt Cobain in memory of him. The one that we just showed you and then this one right over here. Looks like the trash can even has some messages written on that. As you can see, this bench isn't as decorated as the other one is, or at least it, it might have faded over time. But it's nice to see that there's a place that you know fans can come and pay their respects and write a little note. A baby ghoul, do you remember where you were or any of your thoughts uh, whenever it was announced that Kurt Cobain died back in 1994? I do not remember exactly where I was. I want to say that I was in a car, so I have a feeling of where I was, mostly feeling like movement. And he died on April 5th, right? April so, 5th, his body was found on April 8th. My birthday is April 3rd. I had just turned 12 years old. Mostly I remember, I think I got one of his CDs and that's the, the biggest memory I have around his death is thinking something like, I didn't think things like that happen to people in my generation, sort of, you know, because I, I knew of John Lennon and he was this massive guy, right? World, world renowned. But I remember thinking, oh, I didn't think Nirvana was around that long or that big, even though I'd heard them on the radio. So I had thoughts like that, mostly around then, and just kind of being like confused about it. And then all of the coverage for his passing, because it was, it was a big deal, massive, and all you ever saw on the television stuff is all these people crying, these teens and stuff, people my age, you know, having these massive breakdowns. And that's mostly what I remember about that. 
Did you ever think that you'd ever get the chance to visit the spot where Cobain died? No way. I mean, this is Washington. It's the farthest state in the West, in the upper corner. I'm from the Midwest. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, which is smack dab in the center of the United States. So coming to a place like Washington feels a lot further than saying, I'm going to Florida. Like that seems more attainable than going to Washington. Never in my lifetime did I think I'd get to pay respects to somebody who had a big presence in my early days. When it comes to memories from my childhood, I'm always afraid that what I'm remembering is not how it actually happened. Like my childhood growing up, my family, the things that I was going through, I had a lot of issues. And I had a lot of issues right around the time that I found Nirvana. So for me, Nirvana was actually pretty instrumental, if you will. So with that being said, if I remember correctly, April 8th, 1994, whenever the world found out that Kurt Cobain passed away, I was eating lunch at Seneca Valley Junior High School in Zelenople, Pennsylvania. It was a pretty big lunchroom. It was pretty massive. And back whenever I was in school, I don't know if they still have it, they had TVs like Channel One. Does anybody remember Channel One? It was basically news for classrooms by kids about like everyday life. And uh, I want to say it was Kurt Loder, like somebody put on MTV because it was pretty big. And that's how I found out that Kurt Cobain died. You really can't see much of the house through the trees. You can just make out the, the top part of the house, the, some of the windows, the chimney, the roof. The greenhouse would have been to the back, to the, towards the left-hand side of the screen. There are a couple different pathways that go up into the woods behind the house. But right over here, about the center of your screen on the other side of those bushes, is where the greenhouse once stood. You can see at the top of the roof of the house towards the right. There's even a pathway that goes through the woods up to the gate right next to the house. A bunch of people have come and wrote their names on and different messages. I wasn't going to come back here because I don't want to get too close to the house respecting people's property and their privacy. But I'm here. Now, Kurt and Courtney, they didn't live here that long. If I'm not mistaken, they bought the house a couple months before his death. We're going to take a little walk up the trail into the woods to see if we can get another view of something. But if not, I think we're just going to show you the front gate, the driveway. Then there's a couple other locations that have to do with Kurt Cobain and Nirvana here in Seattle that we want to show you guys. Very peaceful, very peaceful here. Get a little bit of exercise in here in Seattle. I don't think there's anything up here. But I have to come and check it out. Because if I go home and I find out that there's something up here, I'm going to be a little, uh, little disappointed. Right now I'm walking on the street that's above and behind the house. And the reason I'm doing this, I'm trying to find the spot that some photos were taken the day that Kurt's body was found. Um, I don't know if it was a paparazzi or if it was media, but there was a couple different shots of the detectives standing at the entrance to the greenhouse, even, when, even more so whenever they were taking Kurt's body out. And they were taken from up high and from behind. I'm trying to find that spot, and I think it's right here. Again, not trespassing, but there's a little break in the woods right here, like a little path that goes down. Yeah, there's the house. Now if I zoom in just a little bit here, well, let's take it in as far as we can. Right about the center of your screen is where the greenhouse once stood. 
So I don't know if the cameras, the camera guy was here or if he was on the other side of the tree to the left. But like I said, they tore that greenhouse down not too long after Kurt's death. She has been I don't think I need to say this, but if you do come to a place like this, no trespassing. I mean, everybody around here pretty much knows why you're here in the first place. And there are signs and be respectful. I mean, you can pretty much tell where people have gone and where people have left notes and in memory of Kurt. But I will say this, be careful where you park because not even like a block that way down the hill, there's a nude beach. We saw things we'll never be able to take back. Standing in front of the driveway, looking up at the house, this is the view that you get. See what I mean? You can't see anything. Well, barely. If you look just above the driveway gate, you can see part of the house, some of the stonework there, as well as that window up there at the point. It's beautiful property right next to a lake. I mean, facing a lake, really. The vigil for Kurt Cobain was held on April 10th, 1994 here in Seattle at a place known as Seattle Center. Now the exact location where it was held was a place known as the Flag Pavilion. But a lot has changed and now the exact location is known as Fisher Pavilion. And that's what we're looking for right now. What you're looking at right now is the Space Needle here in Seattle. And then that building right there towards the bottom is Fisher Pavilion. But like we said back in the day, it used to be called Flag Pavilion. Because if we pan the camera over here to the left, you can see the lawn. There used to be a whole bunch of flags here representing different parts of the world. Looking at a bunch of video and different pictures that were taken that day, April 10th, 1994, you can see behind me there were a bunch of flags and then there was this weird lightning bolt statue, like an art sculpture. It's no longer here. Instead, it's on the other side of the Space Needle. But right in front of that lightning bolt is where they set up the stage. I haven't felt the excitement of listening to as well as creating music along with really writing something for too many years now. I feel guilty beyond words about these things. For example, when we're backstage and the lights go out and the manic roar of the crowd begins, it doesn't affect me the way in which it did for Freddie Mercury, <laughs> who seemed to love and relish in the love and adoration from the crowd, which is something I totally admire and envy. The fact is, I can't fool you, any one of you. It simply isn't fair to you or to me. The worst crime I can think of would be to pull people off by faking it, pretending as if I'm having 100% fun. And for sake of completion, we're now on the other side of the Space Needle. About the center of your screen is the Mopop Museum of Pop Culture. And like I said, the lightning bolt that can be seen behind the stage during Kurt Cobain's vigil is right there. It's still here, so you can come and see it. It was in the video. At the time of recording this video, it was Memorial Day weekend, and there was a big fair that was happening here at Seattle Center Park. All this chaos is all the vendors and all the people who put it together tearing everything down, so bear with us. It's a little, uh, a little crazy. Now this fountain that's behind us is known as International Fountain and it plays a big part in that day. To be honest, it's a little hard to tell because the video is so grainy, but it kind of looks like this bowl that surrounds this fountain was filled with some sort of rock, almost like a lava rock. But you can see people everywhere here, including climbing on the dome that the water's coming out, just enjoying the water spray, just kind of like taking it in. It's a beautiful fountain, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm guessing on a hot day here in Seattle, it's quite refreshing, but it's kind of cool today. There's no way in heckins we're getting in there. Now there's a couple things about this place that I want to point out. The first one being this. With all the people here, it was a pretty big deal. It was part of the healing process. And at first, over there on the stage, which is what I'm looking at over that way, the stage is there, the fountain is here. Uh, there was a pre-recorded message from Courtney Love where she actually 
addressed what happened to the fans and she read portions of Kurt Cobain's note that he left behind. And then afterwards, once everybody left and there was a few people still hanging out, probably at the fountain, Courtney Love actually showed up and talked personally with some people. There's some video of her doing that. Because he doesn't want to be known for being a, a drug addict and he doesn't want to be known for being a, a loser or anything that wrestling will call, call, call him, you know. We all know what he gave to us, you know. If it had happened to me, Kurt would be sitting down here in this park with you too. He never made himself inaccessible to people. If you stopped him on the street, even if you looked like you just stepped off an airplane, you were stirred as he'd still have talked to you for 10 minutes. You know, he was like so good that way and had no attitude. And I wish he'd had a little more attitude because that might have helped. But what it would have helped more than anything was no gun. So just try and do that, right? The building you're looking at right now in the center of your screen is the old Lusty Lady strip club here in Seattle. It's no longer here, it's been gone for quite some time, but we are actually here for the marquee that's still there right above the door. You see where it says live show on both sides? Well, this place has a very, it's rumored to have a very special place, if you will, in the legend that is Nirvana. Because the Lusty Lady Strip Club is no longer here, the marquee has been blank for some time, but there used to be, down at the very, very bottom there, the very last line, a smiley face that looked very, very close to the Nirvana logo, and it would say, have an exotic day. It is believed that this is where they pulled that inspiration from. And would you look at that, right in the center of your screen, even though the Nirvana logo is gone right on the marquee, there are three smiley faces on the sticker right next to the S, where it says live show. And even though it's gone, it's still pretty neat to just kind of walk and see what used to be here. I wonder what it looks like on the inside. Like what has changed, if anything? This place is such a small stop on a Nirvana tour here in Seattle, but it's a place I've always wanted to visit and I don't see many people talking about it. So the lusty lady, the smiley face, I'm going to say it came from here. I think it's about time for a little bit of a lunch break. We're gonna head over to the Hard Rock Cafe here in Seattle. Honestly, the food's not really that good, but on the inside, they have some Nirvana music memorabilia. Right here front and center is an old ovation acoustic guitar that says belonged to Kurt Cobain's aunt, and he would still play it from time to time. Now this is really cool. It says this bride and groom snow globe was on top of Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love's wedding cake when they were married on February 24th, 1992. That's pretty neat to see. I don't know how well this closing is gonna end with the sound of the fountain beside me. It might be too loud, but we're giving it a shot. Hopefully the water jets don't turn on me and drench me. Whew. With that being said, thank you for joining us on another grim adventure, this time telling the story of Kurt Cobain. Until next time, happy Halloween. Wherever I come, I've had luck. It's coming my way. Wherever I go, hard luck. Is that in state? Good luck never stays a day. A battle's always a coming my way. 